Welcome, everybody, to this edition of the live stream. We're coming to you live from the Huckabee Theater, just outside of Nashville, where we'll be producing our show this weekend. And it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful show with Governor Mike Parson of Missouri and the legendary Oak Ridge Boys. They're in their final season. 50 years they've been performing, and uh, they're calling it quits. This is their farewell tour, and it's a legitimate one. It's not like the uh, 17th annual farewell tour that Cher does every year. Uh, they really are going to retire. And it's sad to think that uh, we won't have the Oak Ridge Boys performing on stage, but they'll be here with us this weekend. It's going to be a great show. We hope you'll watch it this weekend here on TVN. Uh, Johnny Livesey is with me. We are going to be taking your questions today. and We hope that you are prepared and we'll start sending them in the chat. In fact, you can start doing it right now. And for more visibility, send a super chat. We've got moderators keeping an eye on what you send. They'll forward them to us. We've got a lot of things to get to. Highlights from throughout the week. We're certainly going to be talking about the State of the Union address and a few of the, well, let's just say stretches of the imagination that Joe Biden told during that whole process. Finally, we're going to show you some secret footage of people who have been tasked with sneaking illegal immigrants into the country. All of that right here today on the live stream. One of the things we love to do is have a pre-show poll so that those of you who get here early and join us in the queue already, we give you a little something to uh, maybe respond to. So Johnny, what kind of pre-show poll do we have today? Well, this one is uh, a little controversial, uh, perhaps, to some. Uh, the question is, how do you think Biden's staff made sure Biden got through his speech? A, promised him ice cream. Huh. B, promised him a scratch and sniff. Huh. C, pumped him up with something. Or D, threatened him with Kamala's laugh. Ooh. I'd say threatened him with Kamala's laugh. <laughs> that would be... My I mean, thought that that would have been my pick, too. I, I think that could have kept him awake. Uh, so the uh, top answer was pumped him up with something at 64 percent, promised him ice cream at 25 percent, promised him a scratch and sniff at seven and threatened him with Kamala's laugh. Four uh, percent. Hmm. Yeah, I'm clearly out yeah, of touch with too. the viewers today. I thought I was more in touch, but but those four percent were thinking alike. Uh, I, I wonder if he was jacked up with something i mean it just seemed like that he was so he was so loud he, it right. wasn't like he came out and made a speech right from the opening moment he just started yelling yeah and i thought what has happened yeah and just the day before all throughout the week and particularly the day before there were moments where he was on camera in front of the press acting like you know just another week in a Bernie situation. Yeah. Could barely talk, you know, talk, I'm going to get in trouble if I take questions, that yeah. sort of weird stuff. And then a day later, way after his bedtime, he's that energetic? I don't know. I don't buy it. Uh, we'll be talking about it in the course of uh, the day. Well, our top comment from last live stream, and it's been a few weeks. We've been uh, in a little bit of a production break. Fresh shows every week but we pre-taped in order to make it happen. But this comment from Max Isert, who said, quote, the Georgia case has become a Jerry Springer show. I think that may be unkind to the Jerry Springer show because uh, it's, it's been wilder in many ways. It's stuff you can't make up, uh, but a great comment from Max uh, Isert there. Here's my question for you this week. Would love to get your input. What was your impression of Joe Biden's State of the Union speech? Leave your answers in the chat or in the comments section below. And this would be a great time for you to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. Be sure to like and share. All of those things, four things, but they're very important to making sure that we get to as many people as possible. Before we get to the State of the Union, a couple of other things that happened this week. One, and this was somewhat of a surprise to me. I've always kind of liked Charles Barkley, the basketball uh, player who is retired now, sportscaster, and he's really good on TV. Uh, but apparently he does not care at all for conservatives, Republicans, and especially Donald Trump. And he was on CNN with Gail King. And it wasn't just that he was disparaging, but I 
just was shocked at the vitriol that he had, uh, even a pledge of violence, and he didn't walk it back. Watch what I'm talking about here. Yeah, and you know who embraced it more than anybody else? The black population. It's incredible. You see black people walking around with my mugshot. You know, they do shirts. When you heard that, what did you think? <sighs> Big sigh. First Big of all, sigh. I'm just going to say this. If I see a black person walking around with Trump mugs, I'm going to punch him in the face. Charles. I know, Gil. Charles. Gil. Gil, Gil you, I, you really can't say that because, A, you don't mean that. You, oh, I mean that sincerely. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he did mean it sincerely, and he kept on with it. Um, he, here's going to be bad news for Charles Barkley. Recent polls have shown that Donald Trump's support among African Americans has grown significantly, and his support among Hispanics has been exponential. And a lot of people, particularly in the liberal world, are just stunned. They can't imagine. Well, let me explain it to you. African American people are not monolithic. Maybe they historically have kind of voted that way with Democrats, but they care about their families, their jobs, their income, their retirement, the safety of their neighborhoods and streets. And they're watching this country go down the toilet. And it's affecting them more than it's affecting the Charles Barclays of the world who gets to travel in relative ease and has bodyguards and he's not really worried about somebody coming up and hitting him in the back of the head with a brick. Uh, his home is, I'm sure, behind a gated community. He has nothing to worry about there. Uh, and frankly, he's got millions and millions and millions of dollars. So the price of a hamburger at Five Guys doesn't really affect him. So he's out of touch with people, uh, whether they're black, Hispanic, or white. And frankly, I don't think people are so color-driven as he might think. I'd like to think that people are smart enough to think for themselves. But that was pretty interesting. Now, we don't have any surprise whatsoever to hear Joy Reid go off on another racist rant because she sees everything, and I mean everything, through the lens of race. And here is a clear example of this MSNBC lunatic with another racist comment. But Republican voters don't vote that way. They don't vote based on economics or based on the benefits they're getting economically from the president. They're increasingly, from the Tea Party on, they're voting on race. They're voting on this idea of an invasion of brown people over the border. The idea that they can't get whatever job they want. A black person got it, therefore drive all the blacks out of the colleges, get rid of DEI. That is what they're voting on. They're yeah. just voting specifically on racial animus. Which at this stage, it isn't about economics. No. That is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard a person on television say. No, Republicans do not vote on the basis of race. That's nonsense. There is a growing number of people of color who are becoming Republican. And you know why? Because they actually care about how far their paycheck might stretch. They have to buy gasoline and groceries, and they can't buy it with the same buying power that they had when Donald Trump was president. They're not stupid. They can see that. They also like to live in a safe neighborhood. I don't care what color you are. You don't want your home to be burglarized, have a home invasion, have your car stolen, stop at a, a traffic light and have someone carjack you. Uh, there are just some things that have nothing whatsoever to do with race. And I think Joy Reid has lost what little mind she has had. When she says comments like that, utterly discredits her. I, I know... A lot of Republicans, probably more than I know Democrats, just because I tend to hang out with more like that. I honestly don't know of a single Republican, white, black, brown, whatever, who votes because of race and, and who is conservative, where race has a doggone thing to do with it. I just don't believe that that's even close to reality. All right. We said we get into the State of the Union. How can we not? It was just a bizarre experience from even the very start. Joe Biden comes in. He's supposed to come in, of course, to the cheers and accolades of the crowd. And then he stands at the podium after handing a speech to the speaker and the vice president. And then he's to stand there and the speaker of the House, the protocol is the speaker of the House, 
then gives him the formal introduction. We go through the whole standing ovation. In a way, I was glad that he botched it. The question is, did he just forget? And if he did, that's frightening. He was vice president, sat there for eight years, State of the Union, before that for almost 50 years as a U.S. senator. He knows the drill. Heck, I know the drill. And I've been neither a vice president or a senator. So did he just forget that he was supposed to be introduced? Or did he want to rob Speaker Mike Johnson of his one moment in the spotlight of being able to say, it is my high honor and privilege to present the President of the United States, President Joe Biden? I don't know. We'll never really know, I guess. But that's how the whole thing started. Let's watch. Good evening. If I were smart, I'd go home now. Mr. Speaker, Madam Vice President, members of Congress. Well, there was one thing he said that I guess a lot of people agreed with. If he was smart, he would stop right there. He didn't stop there, so I guess now we know. By his own admission, he ain't smart. There we got it. Get that over with. Um, I think for many of us watching him, it was bizarre because it was like he was on speed. Did he have a shot of methamphetamine? Did he get into Hunter's stash? We don't know what happened. But out of the gate, rather than beginning with uh, kind comments and sort of the obligatory welcome and uh, looking at wistfully the great condition of the United States, he basically walked out the door on his porch and started yelling and screaming at everyone in the neighborhood. And it was just bizarre to watch. Um, here's an example. Because I invested in the family farms led by my sector of agriculture and knows more about this than anybody I know. We're better able to stay in the family for the, those farms for the, and their children and grandchildren won't have to leave, leave home to make a living. It's transformative. It's like every... Fourth or fifth word, you kind of understood what he was saying. The time, I already told you what it was. It was it's agriculture, and that's one more thing I want to ignore. What was he saying? Yeah, have you seen those videos? Uh, what English sounds like to <laughs> non-English speakers? That, <laughs> that sounds a lot like it does sound a lot yeah. like it, doesn't yeah. it? It's like he's speaking in tongues, but we need an interpretation <laughs> out there somewhere. Uh, for those of you who are hardcore Pentecostal and you know, used to going to a church where someone breaks out and speaking in tongues. Typically, somebody's there to say, here, I will interpret. There was nobody there to interpret that, and it was pretty wild. There was a, a very um, interesting moment, and, and at the time, I didn't know what was happening. I thought it was just a heckler. I thought maybe it was a pro-Palestinian person, but there was a moment in which uh, a gentleman, we now know his name, Steve Nakui, his uh, son was one of the 13 Marines who was killed in the botched uh, exit from Afghanistan. So this gold star dad, Steve Nakui, was sitting in the uh, gallery. And, and to be fair, the house rules are very explicit. Visitors know they're not supposed to have any outburst. Um, but it just was too much for this father and he stood up, and I didn't know what he was saying last night. I couldn't make it out. But now we know he was saying Abbey Gate and speaking out and saying Marine, uh, my Marine son. But at the time, we didn't know. But anyway, I want you to watch the moment and then a little postscript of what happened afterwards. The year before I took office, murder rates went up 30 percent. 30 percent they went up. The biggest increase in history. Yeah, I was clearly uh, unhappy with the fact that when Joe Biden had this very messed up exit from Afghanistan, there was really never a sense of responsibility or accountability. Mm -hmm. Those 13 should never have died. Um, now, here's the, the part of it that gets interesting. This gold star dad, he was invited by Congressman Brian Mast of Florida to be there. Um, was arrested, wasn't just escorted out of the room and given a good talking to. He was actually arrested on misdemeanor charges of disrupting Congress. And I'm thinking, okay, 
when people are in those hearings and they jump up and scream and they disrupt the proceedings, do they get arrested? Can I tell you the answer? No. They just get escorted out of the room. This guy gets arrested. And I'm not sure why. And I'm hoping that there will be even some Democrats who will say he was out of line. He shouldn't have had the outburst. But we understand and we can certainly accept that the emotions of losing his son were overwhelming. And so appropriate that he was escorted out of the room. But we will insist that no charges be filed. That would be the classy thing to do. Let's see. If there are enough Democrats, perhaps Joe Biden himself could be classy enough to give this gold star father a little bit of a break. Let's hope so. All right, I want us to go through five claims that President Biden made in the course of the State of the Union, things that just didn't quite hold up to reality. Uh, there's been a lot of talk since Lakin Riley, the young lady, a nursing student down in Georgia, was murdered by an illegal uh, alien who was here from Venezuela. Um, he shouldn't have been here. He had been deported a few times already, kept coming back into the country. Uh, Lake and Riley should be alive, and she would be if we enforced our border. But we don't enforce it. Joe Biden has left it wide open. And you just can't go to any other conclusion other than the blood of this young lady is on the hands of those who have turned their backs on the border and on the American people and allowed this to continue to happen. So... Marjorie Taylor Greene, Congresswoman from Georgia, um, yelled out during this speech, and, and I'll be, again, very clear. I don't think that was appropriate. I don't care what your party is. I thought it was wrong when Nancy Pelosi tore Donald Trump's speech up. I thought it was wrong when Democrat women yelled at Donald Trump uh, when he was giving his State of the Union. I don't think it was appropriate that Marjorie Taylor Greene had her outburst. There's a time, there's a place. But there should be a decorum in the halls of Congress. Maybe no respect for Joe Biden's policies, but respect for the office. And if you have some real problems, and I do, and obviously she does, there's a time and a place that ain't it. Nevertheless, she cried out to him, interrupted his speech. He did acknowledge the death, but he didn't know her name and called her Lincoln. Her name is Lakin. Let's watch. I'd be a winner, not really. I. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by illegals? I mean, one of the things that everyone is asking, that last statement, how many thousands of people are being killed by illegals? Here's what's interesting. I don't think that's what he meant to say. I think he meant to say there's not that many people being killed, but actually there are because the fentanyl coming across is killing about 100,000 a year, and then we have these murders. Lake and Riley is not the only one. And Joe obviously didn't know her name, called her Lincoln twice, um, here's what I, I just tell you, I, I find this very troubling, is that, you know what the Democrats were upset with in that whole scene? That Joe Biden used the term illegal. They were far more upset that he used the term illegal because they want to call him undocumented um, guest. You know, that's, that's nonsense. They have come across the border illegally. And so it's a proper thing to say. But if you're a liberal, you don't use that term. Joe Biden did. That was off the cuff. Maybe it was a Freudian slip that he actually told the truth. There's an old saying that a gaffe is when a politician accidentally tells the truth. Well, that's kind of what happened. So he said illegal. Democrats today have just been livid, not because a young lady was murdered while she was out for a jog. No, they're upset because Joe Biden called the murderer an illegal. That's the state of our union, folks. And it's a sorry state. When the president calls an illegal alien illegal and his own party is upset, not at the death of the young lady, but because he used a term that was appropriate and accurate. 
It's absolutely unbelievable. Well, in the course of the State of the Union, Joe gets back to his uh, normal rhetorical devices, one of which is just to tell things that never happened and to make it up. And one of the things that he talks about is his extraordinary understanding of the Second Amendment because he says he taught the Second Amendment for 12 years. Listen. Pass universal background checks. None of this. None of this. I taught the Second Amendment for 12 years. None of this violates the Second Amendment. Well, that's simply untrue. Uh, first of all, it's questionable whether it would violate the Second Amendment. Here's what's not questionable. Joe Biden's never taught the Second Amendment 12 years. He had a contract for over a million dollars a year to teach at the University of uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, he never taught. Never taught. Never had not one class did he teach. Not one. And this idea that he taught for 12 years. When was that 12 year period? It didn't happen. And that's so easy for the whole world to disprove. The so-called fact checkers can look that up, but they don't because they don't care if Joe Biden tells a whopper. And that's not the only one he tells. Uh, here's another one that he told talking about January 6th of 2021. This is the booger bear that the Democrats cannot let go of. And they continue to say it was the biggest, quote, threat to democracy. Some of will say that we've ever had. Joe, at least, only went back to the Civil War. January 6th lies about the 2020 election and the plots to steal the election posed a great, gravest threat to U.S. democracy since the Civil War. But they failed. Once again, for him to say that the biggest threat to democracy was the dude wearing a Viking hat and a uh, a loincloth walking around the Capitol, that that was a bigger threat to democracy than 9-11, than World War II, uh, than the Watts riots, uh, than 1968 and the Chicago Convention. Where, where does he get this? I, I'm just stunned. Yeah, it's crazy. And I, I, when I was doing some research on this, there was another one uh, in 1954 four Peruvian gunmen made Puerto their way, Rican. Puerto Rican, thank yeah. you, yeah, 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 that's right, um, made their way into the White House to the House Gallery and shot five lawmakers. Yeah. Like, that's not more of a threat to democracy than the J6 riot. I mean, I'm not saying that it was a good thing that it happened. I don't yeah. think anybody does. You have to be kind of crazy to say that it was a good thing. That it was that a horrible happened. thing. But we've but all to say said that, that, that was, was a horrible. greater threat to democracy. Yeah, but I mean, to, to somehow make that the worst thing since the Civil War. Right. Uh, I mean, again, you, you'd have to really be out of your mind to think that of all the things that have happened in this country, that was the single biggest thing. Um, yeah, the Bernie Sanders supporter that shot up the ball field and mm -hmm. nearly murdered Steve Scalise and did shoot. Secret Service agents and other people who were there that day. Um, you know, that was a threat to democracy. All these riots of 2020 in the summer that burned down courthouses, police stations, and private businesses across America. Hundreds of people killed in the course of that. Um, anyway, it, it's bizarre, but that's Joe Biden's position is that it was the greatest threat since the Civil War. And I just think a whole lot of us are, are scratching our heads trying to figure out how could that be? All right, a couple of others here that we're going to get to before we take your questions. We're almost there. Um, Joe Biden also was 40 minutes into his speech before he ever mentioned the border, which is the number one issue on most voters' minds across America. Uh, he, again, absolves himself of any responsibility for the mess we have and blames it on, of course, Republicans. In November... My team began serious negotiation with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, you don't think so? No, I don't think so, Joe. It's not true. It's a big, fat lie. It wasn't about border security. It was about the cosmetics of putting some more agents in place, but mostly to process the paperwork, and you were still going to let $8 million a, a year come through. This was insane. I mean, the whole thing w was a head-scratcher, 
And I don't know why James Langford, the senator from Oklahoma, got behind it. Uh, I think he, you know, in fairness to him, thought it was a way to help resolve it. But here's how you resolve it. Close the border. Do what every other country in the world does. I, I traveled quite a bit around the globe and have for the past 45, 50 years, and I can tell you something. I've yet to go to a country that they didn't check my passport and verbally asked me, what are you doing in our country? Why are you here? Business or pleasure? Where will you be staying? And make it very clear. You got to get out of here after a certain length of time. You can't stay indefinitely. Not that I would want to, but my point being, I'm not offended that I have to show a passport. I have that expectation. And if I didn't have a passport, I don't think they'd shrug their shoulders and say, ah, no big deal, come on in. And I tell you what they'd never done, offer to give me a hotel room for the time I'm there, three meals a day, free health care, educate my kids, and give me a gift card for $10,000. But if you illegally cross the border of the United States right now under Joe Biden, you get jetted or bused to some city that maybe you'd like to go to. Never been to New York? Ah, come on in. We'll put you in a hotel. We don't have room for our veterans who are homeless and living on the streets, but an illegal, by gosh, we'll put you in the hotel. Need to eat? Three times a day, you'll be fed. Oh, need some spending money. Here's a $10,000 gift card from the city of New York. And if you get hurt or sick, don't worry, we'll cover your health care. Your grandma not, might not be able to take uh, herself to the doctor, but we'll treat people who shouldn't even be in this country. I'm not against immigration. I just cannot be emphatic enough that I'm all about immigration and people coming here from all over the world. They make America a better place but they don't do it if they don't come through the front door and if we have no idea why they've come, mm -hmm. where they've come from, do they have a communicable disease, are they members of a gang, are they bringing in drugs, are they here to sex traffic? We have a right to know those things. Yeah, It's just absurd. All right, final thing about the State of the Union. Voter suppression. Joe Biden claims that there has been serious voter suppression. And I, I'm going to play this clip, but before I do, let me remind you of something. The Democrats don't mind saying that if Republicans question anything about an election, that there was ballot stuffing, the mail-in ballots were fraudulent, it's an anathema. It is so horrible that we hate democracy, but they don't have any, any qualms whatsoever in saying that their votes are being suppressed that they're not being able to go and vote because somebody would actually ask for their photo ID. I voted the other day in Little Rock during Super Tuesday. The people at the desk recognized me. They knew who I was. You know what? They still asked for my photo ID. And did I go, Whoa, what do you mean photo ID? I don't just No, I pulled it out of my wallet. I already had it out, quite frankly. And I joyfully showed it to them because I want to do it the right way. I don't have a problem with that. Here's Joe Biden. He's got a problem. Their force is taking us back in time. Voter suppression, election subversion, unlimited dark money, extreme gerrymandering. Uh, it's all uh, fine if they question an election. Hillary Clinton questioned it. Stacey Abrams questioned it. Johnny was mentioning that uh, Katie Porter, who came in third in the Senate race in California, questioned the legitimacy of that race. It's fine, no problem. If a Republican does it, then they're a threat to democracy. All right, let's take a gander at some of our questions that are coming in. We appreciate you uh, sending them to us and see what you got. Sure. Uh, all right, we've got uh, this comment from Gary Todeshi. Hope I said that right. Being an old man myself, he, Biden, will be out of it for a couple of days. He was doing some kind of dope. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to argue with you, Gary. I thought something was up because that wasn't like we've seen Joe. Yeah. So uh, David Indiana asks, constitutionally, can Trump serve two more terms? No, he cannot. Only two terms total. So he can serve one more and that's it. Let's see. I've uh, got this super chat from Stud467, bunch of numbers, $5. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, Mike, will Robert Kennedy get in on all state ballots? And what is your message for Women's History Month? Hmm. 
Uh, RFK Jr. will get in on all the ballots. I think he's already qualified for all of them. And uh, the message for Women's History Month is that, um, you know, women have never had as much opportunity as they do now. Is it always fair and equal? Probably not. But we have now a female vice president. Um, we've got some several more than ever women governors. I happen to know one who made history by becoming the first in my home state of Arkansas, grew up in my household. So I know about her. Um, you know, I, I don't think that we're living in the sexist times that I grew up in. I mean, in the 50s and 60s, you know, there was that attitude. Go back and look at the ads that ran. And it's, it's almost just astonishing what people would expect for women to accept as a, quote, role. And I think none of us would accept that today. So as uh, the old ad from Virginia Slim said in the early 1970s, you've come a long way, baby. Okay, let's take one more, and then we're going to have to start winding her down. Okay. Uh, Richard Beard, how can one man tell so many lies and live with himself? I think uh, people will probably ask this question about a lot of politicians. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, in the case of uh, how does Joe Biden get away with saying stuff like that he taught Second Amendment 12 years, that he's done a great job at the border? I'll tell you why, because the press doesn't call him out on it. If you don't have a responsible press that calls balls and strikes fairly and honestly, then you do have a rigged game. And that's what we're living with right now. And it's it's tragic because you, the American people, um, you're the ones who ultimately are punished by not only a press that's irresponsible, but by a government that works with social media companies and mainstream media companies to suppress news they don't want you to know and to make up stuff that they want you to think is true. That's what we're dealing with. It's why this election becomes more important uh, than any I've ever seen. I know we always say that, but this one truly is because of uh, the misinformation and the lack of information that many voters will even be exposed to in the course of the year. Well, as we said, we've got a great show lined up for you this weekend here on TBN. I hope you will watch. I can't imagine that you wouldn't. We'd love to have your thoughts in the comments. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button, the like button, click that notification bell. And live with Mike streams pretty much every Friday, unless we tell you otherwise. We're so glad that you joined us. Here's a little preview of the show this week. This week on Huckabee, Governor Mike Parson on the 2024 presidential race. World record holding athlete Zion Clark talks about foster care reform. Have a laugh with comedian Brandon Vestal. There's an app in California that tells you if Republicans live in your neighborhood. And harmony that transcends time. The legendary Oak Ridge Boys. Watch Huckabee Saturday at 8, 7 central and again on Sunday at 9, 8 central right here on TBN.